Good morning, loved ones, and Happy New Year. Would you join me in a word of prayer as we begin this morning? Lord Jesus, I come to you now and I ask you to clear our thoughts, to take away any and all distractions. Help us, I pray, to prepare to come now to this time of worship. I ask you, Lord, through your spirit and through your word to refine us, starting with me. Help each of us, I pray, to come away from this time in your word and in your presence. Different. Change us. Refine us. Lord Jesus, please do in us what only you can do, that you will do through us, again, only what you can do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, again, let me just say to you, Happy New Year. In fact, let me just ask you on the heels of a new year, as we enter into this 2016, what New Year's resolutions might you be pondering? Or uh, perhaps at this point, there are still promises. Uh, what, what are you looking at doing? What are to accomplish? You know, what are your aims and your ambitions for this new and upcoming year? Think about it. No doubt you've already wrestled with some things, but it's my prayer that today, as we continue in our series called The Way of God, and we continue to walk through the book of Acts, particularly today in Acts chapter 19, verses 8, 9, and 10, my prayer is that you will walk away perhaps with a slightly different, radically different, or at least refined set of aims and ambitions for not just this upcoming year, but for the rest of your life. You see, it is my goal, as it is on a weekly basis, that in bringing to you the Word of God, through the power and in the presence of Almighty God and His Spirit, it's my prayer that we will constantly be in a state of refinement, that the Lord will see to it by His grace to have us in a constant state of change towards ever more Christ-likeness. And today, to that end, I'd like to pick up where we left off and pose to you this question. Whose side are you on? Whose side are you on? You say, Pastor Jeff, well, that begs the broader question of uh, what teams are you talking about? And, and to, to what end are you asking that question? Well, it should be no surprise that my question is the eternal. Whose side are you on in God's great economy of eternity? And before you quickly jump out and say, well, that's an obvious question, I again would like to ask you, to let God and his word pose the question to you and set the standards for our answers. And in so doing, it's my prayer that you will see as we look closely today at Acts chapter 19, verses 8, 9, and 10, that there are really three categories of people. There are those who are spirit-led, capital S, Holy Spirit-led there are those who are spirit dead, those in whom the spirit of God does not reside, thereby leaving them eternally dead. And lastly, those who are spirit fed and depending upon how they receive what they are fed, whether they digest it and turn into biblical disciples or if they vomit it up and are spiritually bulimic, you see, they will ultimately end up, those who are spirit-fed, as either being ultimately and eternally spirit-led or, by default, remaining in God's wrath and out of his favor and grace, and thereby remain spirit-dead. So, let's take a look at God's Word. And again, I'm going to walk very slowly today, and I want to encourage you, if you're not if you're not one who's accustomed to going to the notes, today, this message, um, it grabbed me. 
And although it's just three verses, there are over 80 pages of notes waiting for you. If you'd like to press in to some of what you hear and learn today, I want you to know that there is a consistent uh, pool of uh, scholarly, evangelical, conservative, biblical study waiting for you in the notes. And today is an exceptional day to that end. But with that said, let's go to God's Word, and I'd like to read all three verses and then come back and unpack each one and show us this contrast between the Spirit-led, the Spirit-dead, and those who will have to decide where they will pursue their purpose and the promises of their life, whether or not they will surrender to victory and come under the Spirit's guiding, or if they will continue to reject and push away, live under self-rule and self-lordship, and thereby end up amongst the Spirit dead. But let's listen to the three verses, and then we'll come back. God's Word says, And he, this is Paul, and he entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some were becoming hardened or stubborn and disobedient, continuing in their unbelief, speaking evil, about the way before the people or congregation. He, again Paul, withdrew from them and took with him the disciples or the believers, reasoning daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This took place for two years. So that, so that, all, who lived in Asia, heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Friends, in here we will see the three categories, really almost perfectly uh, aligned by the three verses. In verse 8, we will see the Spirit led, and here again God gives us the example that you and I are to follow as Paul shows us his obedience to what Christ called us to, commanded us to, commissioned us for. And by the way, what Jesus himself demonstrated, Paul now emulates and gives for us the same model that we are to live out. We will see what it is to be spirit-led on mission for our Messiah. In verse 9, we will see a snapshot of the spirit dead and I want you to take very close note of this because, again, I'm asking you, whose side are you on? You know, the, the big idea or the timeless truth of this passage in principle is to come to understand that this life, it's not about you. It's not about me. Our lives, especially those that have been surrendered to Christ, those that have been captured by His grace, our lives are here for the purpose of bringing Him glory by living on mission and being those Spirit-led who would be a part of the Spirit-fed movement where God calls others to Himself and ultimately to contrast the Spirit-dead. But we'll see that Spirit-dead in verse 9 and then we'll see the culmination in the contrast as we are left with a beautiful portrait of the Spirit-fed people. So let's walk through this verse by verse. So verse 8 begins with the word and. Please note this. The word and tells us, beginning this passage, that we are attached to that which came before. And I just want to remind you of the context. Paul has now arrived in Ephesus to stay. He had come through town once before, had a, a quick but favorable response, and he said that if the Lord should lead me, I'll be back. Well, he's back. And the first thing he did, we saw in the first seven verses of, verse, of chapter 19 last week, 
he came upon some disciples who were not, let's say, incorrect in what they knew, but they were incomplete in so much as they did not understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. They knew of one that was to come, but they were not surrendered to the truth of the gospel and who Jesus is and what he accomplished on the cross and what he proved through the empty tomb and then the walking amongst the disciples. So we started off with Paul showing those who had a religious affiliation, a foundation of understanding, but who were incomplete, who were not yet Christians. And he told them the truth about the Christ who is Jesus. And in so doing, we saw that the Spirit of God indwelt those folks, 12 men, we were told. And in the filling of the Spirit, we saw the authorization and the justification of salvation demonstrated through the power of the Holy Spirit in these men. And so the takeaway was that you must have received the Spirit of God when you believed to have your belief biblically validated. So in addition to that, we now are told, and he entered. Paul entered the synagogue. He entered demonstrates a going. Once again, Paul has shown us a willingness to go, to engage, to enter in. And where did he enter? He entered the synagogue. Now, he has had peaks and valleys in synagogues. He was warmly received the last time he was in Ephesus, and the folks in the synagogue asked him to stay and teach more, much like he did, uh, much like the Bereans did when he entered into Berea. But we also know that Paul has met with tremendous opposition at times in the synagogues. And so the takeaway here for you and to me is to see the persistence and the persevering, the willingness to go. Paul continues on trying to bring the truth and the love of the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who need to hear. And please recognize he's starting in the church. We saw this last week. We see it again. We've seen it throughout his journeys and we'll see it continue that Paul recognizes that many of the religious, many who are officially in the quote unquote church are not in Christ, are not being the church. So Paul, he comes and once again, as has been his pattern, he goes to the synagogue. He goes to the religious people. He goes to those who should know, but don't know. Those who have the greatest opportunity and the shortest distance in terms of their knowledge to travel if they were to accept the gospel. But oftentimes those that are the farthest away it's been said that the, uh, the 18 inches from the head to the heart is the greatest distance in the world spiritually. We've seen this with Paul. Sadly, I think we see it in our context as well, if we're honest. So he entered the synagogue and he continued. Continued is an interesting word that links the past, the present, and the future. It shows that he is ongoing. It shows that he has a pattern that he is persistent, that what he has been doing, he continues to do. And that is to live on mission, to live surrendered to the purposes and the power and the promise of Christ, all for the people of God. And many of those who have not yet heard that they might believe and receive Christ as Lord. He continued, and he continued speaking out this is a very interesting word. It, it is used for preaching. It is used for confrontation. It is used for contrast. The, the point is that Paul is not going to worry about political correctness. He's not going to worry about how he is received. He's not going to worry about whether or not he's ruffling feathers. Paul is an ambassador and he gets his instruction and he commits in terms of his behavior, his attitude, his heart. It's all committed to his king. As an ambassador, he comes and he speaks out as authorized and as sent by his king. He is speaking out and note this. 
He is speaking out boldly. Friends, I ask you, when was the last time you spoke out boldly for your king as an ambassador? I plead with you to speak out boldly for your king as an ambassador. This boldly, uh, it has been translated elsewhere as fearlessly. Uh, I shared with you last week a definition for fervent. And fervent is to be truth on fire, to speak out fervently, fearlessly, boldly, to go as one who has been sent, to live as one who has a mission, to not worry about anyone or anything under any circumstances. This is what Paul shows us again and again and again and again. He continued speaking out boldly for three months. That's a long time in the setting of the synagogue, but as has happened in the past, it happens again. There comes a point when the religious folks have heard enough. You might say, well, why, why three months? Why not two? Why not four? Well, it's all under the providence of God. God has a plan, and this plan, as it would be in this case, had three months of proclamation, bold proclamation, speaking out in the synagogue. And as we will see, once again, the religious people have had enough of the truth and the love of the gospel. You see, Paul, when you, when you study the scriptures and you see, Paul is relentlessly confrontational in his preaching and his teaching. Why, you might ask? Because Jesus was the same because he knows that unless and until people put down their self-righteous religion and pick up their surrendered state of longing to repent and believe in and on Jesus the Christ, Paul knows that they have no hope. There's no hope to be found in ritual and religion. There is no truth in tradition alone. And so, Paul he speaks out boldly. And he did it in this case for three months. Note, while he was there, he was reasoning. Once again, we see that Paul is going to engage people. The word reasoning in the Greek is that from which we get our word dialogue. He's having exchange. He's engaging people. He's meeting them where they are. And he's not placating to anybody. He's not compromising with the truth, but he's engaging personally, religiously, uh, relational, if you will. He's taking the truths that are eternal and he's applying them in real life conversation, in dialogue. Now, he's not just pontificating. He's reasoning and he's persuading is the next word that we see. Paul is persuading. This word means it's a holistic challenge. He's using everything from the rationale of the mind to the emotion of the heart to the sensitivities of the eyes. Every part of those that he's with, he's engaging. He's speaking on an intellectual level. He's speaking at an emotional level. He's speaking in a practical way. He's reasoning and he's really doing all that he can to convince and to convert the mind and the heart. He's persuading them about the kingdom of God. And, and friends, this could be an entire series. In fact, part of the reason why my notes are so long is I think the Lord may have been prepping me for what will later be at least a sermon, if not a series on the kingdom of God. Let me just say this, that that in this, the kingdom of God and the, the preaching and the teaching and the equipping in the kingdom of God, it is perhaps one of the most um, enlightened way to emulate the ministry of Jesus. Jesus came and he even said in Mark 1.15, he said, when the kingdom of God is near, here's what you need to do. You need to repent and believe in the gospel. You see, the kingdom of God is a multifaceted truth and and to, to try to unpack that all here would be beyond the scope of this message. 
But know this, that the kingdom of God speaks about a very real time when in the future we will see our King Jesus come and reign. But there is also the promise that the kingdom of God is inside the believer, that there is a living out of the kingdom of God to be had for every biblical Christian. You know, if, if you were to put it into the form of a definition, if somebody said, well, what, what is meant by the kingdom of God in these references? And you'll see that all throughout the scriptures, in fact, Acts 1, 3, after Christ has ascended and before he, I'm sorry, as he's come back out of the grave and just before he ascends into heaven, uh, in Acts 1, 3, it says that he came speaking again to the, the disciples about the kingdom of God. He sent them out when he had his earthly ministry and he said, go and preach and teach about the kingdom of God. Paul, on many occasions, referred to himself as a minister of and a preacher of the kingdom of God. His co-workers as well, he described as ministers of the kingdom of God. In a nutshell, friends, the kingdom of God, that which Paul is all about, it's the teaching and preaching, equipping and living out of the truths associated with the fact that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus Christ is Lord. It teaches the truths associated with salvation, not only how to be saved, but then what living as saved looks like. So here at the end of verse 8, please see this. It is in part dovetailing in with what we'll see at the end of verse 10 as the, the real crux of this passage of this point. What the Spirit-led life is all about is living on mission for our Messiah in the midst of His miraculous grace so that others will know and have the same opportunity to repent and receive and believe on Jesus the Christ. This is what it is to be Spirit-led, to live on mission, to share the kingdom of God to the glory of God, recognizing that it's all by the grace of God. Now, Watch what happens when the spirit dead show up. Verse 9. But. You see, the spirit dead are the but people. But, 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 but. You know what I'm talking about. Those that know all the right answers, but seem in living and in life to always have the right answer encapsulated in a but. But. We see here the contrast, the eternal contrast. Don't miss that. We're about to see the eternal contrast. And I ask you again, whose side are you on? Are you with Paul above? Are you speaking out boldly, reasoning with and persuading? Are you going to the dangerous places? Are you willing to surrender your life that you can live for the king? Or are you with the but crowd here in verse 9? But when some men, and I refer you back to Acts chapter 15, verse 1, we've met those and we've studied in depth the difference between some men and true disciples of Jesus the Christ. Oh, they can look very, very similar, but on the inside and eternally, they could not be more different. Here, but when some men were becoming... Note this, it's a process. It is a movement. When some were becoming, when they were shifting, and now I ask you, what are you becoming, friend? Are you becoming more spirit-led? Or are you becoming something that reveals the reality of being spirit-dead? Note, these men, they would not have identified themselves as spirit-dead people. But God's word is going to show us who truly is spirit-led and who is spirit-dead. But when some were becoming hardened or stubborn, this word hardened, it speaks to all throughout the New Testament, whenever it's used, it speaks to rejecting the ways of God. 
It speaks to rejecting the word of God. It speaks to and infers the rejecting of the worship of Jesus the Christ. Not with lip service, but with life service. But some men were becoming hardened. I ask you again, are you becoming hard or are you becoming holy? Do you find yourself in the midst of what God is doing? And I ask you in the context of our local church, because this is where God is at work in our lives up close. Are you finding yourself becoming hardened and stubborn or holy and spirit led? Oh, friends, don't miss this because the whole purpose of these three verses is to show us the contrast in the context of mission. And some were becoming hardened or stubborn. They were rigid in their rituals. They were rigid in their religion. And they were rejecting the truth and the love as given through Paul that was calling people out on mission calling them to the standards of God, calling them to surrender to victory. But some men were becoming hardened and stubborn and disobedient, or another way of translating that word, continuing in their unbelief. I'm asking you again, friend, are you becoming more obedient or less obedient? Are you finding yourself more inspired by the power of the Spirit in enabling and empowering your belief? Or are you sliding down the slippery scope, slope of skepticism? Are you finding yourself more energized to embrace the things of God? Or do you find yourself a bit of an enigma in the presence of God and his people. Friends, don't miss the contrast here between the people that are spirit-led in verse 8 and those that are spirit-dead here in verse 9. When some were becoming hardened or stubborn and disobedient or continuing in unbelief, they were, quote, speaking evil. Note this, the spirit-dead people speak evil. This is two words in our English, speaking evil, but there's one Greek word, and it's made literally of the two words put together, evil speak. These people who are spirit dead, who are stubborn, who are disobedient, who are hardened and continuing in their unbelief, they're also speaking evil. Now, I have to, I have to say to you, I know of some evil speakers that linger in the bushes. I know that there are evil speakers who try to whisper into the ears of the unsuspecting. There are evil speakers that try to divide and pull away the people of God. You know, uh, theologians would tell us as you study this passage that there was a tremendous public display of aggression towards Paul that what this is getting at, the speaking evil, there was literally a movement of foot to discredit Paul and his ministry, that what they were trying to do, these evil spirit dead people, these that were stubborn and hardened, the disobedient, they were trying to pull people away from the truth and the love as shared by Paul. They were trying to tear down Paul and his ministry because he was a direct threat to their status quo, to their way of living. You see, they may not have found themselves on the road to heaven, but they were quite content with the road they were on here on earth. And oh, if only God would wake up those that are around us that are in the exact same place. I've shared with you many times before, and I'm sharing now anew with people here in St. Johnsbury, Vermont, I seldom have any trouble or opposition from those who are overtly lost and desperately in need of Jesus. No. You see, they know that they are destitute and they have no hope. They just don't know what their hope will come from. And when I describe and explain the gospel, 
there's at least an understanding while well, there's an opinion. The problem you see that I find comes from the religious. Those who are insulated in their traditions, those who are complacent in their religion and their rituals, those like Paul was up against here, who would go around and tell others that Paul and the truth of the gospel, Paul and the call to surrender all was unnecessary. It was over the top. It was even heretical, some would say. Paul was actually in the midst of doing something that was not of God, these people would say. But note again, they are the spirit dead. And they are trying to pull people away. They are speaking evil. Now that's not my word, that's God's word. Speaking evil. And friend, every single person that tries to pull others away from the truth of what God has said, the truth of what God is saying, and the truth of what God is showing is speaking evil. Now, who speaks evil? Children of the devil speak evil. Who, who does work against the work of God? The children of the devil, that's who does. Remember, it was Jesus who said, you are either for me or against me. You are either helping me to gather or you are scattering. Not my words. That's our king. That's Jesus. Paul is bringing this to light. God is bringing this to light again. That these men who were stubborn, who were disobedient, were also speaking evil. You know, thinking evil is enough to condemn you. But when you're speaking evil, that demonstrates an intentionality to distort and to disrupt and to divide that which God is doing. I say when it comes at the church, and that's exactly what's happening, they were speaking evil of the way, capital W. That's also known as the church. That's the early Christian movement. You see, when people are speaking evil of the way, I liken that as attacking the bride of Christ. You see, the way is the church. The church is the bride of Christ. To do evil, to speak evil, to intentionally try to hurt the way, the church, the bride of Christ. It's akin to raping the bride of God. Now, I know that's graphic, but I need you to understand that when the Bible says that these people are speaking evil and they are trying to hurt not only one of his men, God's men, but all of God's people. These are the children of God. This is the bride for whom Christ died and actually was tortured on the cross. Don't you dare take lightly the damning work of the devil and his minions when they speak evil against the bride of Christ. I heard of some more of this just this afternoon and it broke my heart. And so I say to you again, do not take lightly these men who are stubborn and hardened, disobedient and deceptive, who speak evil, sometimes with silver tongues, but they're speaking evil. Watch out, watch out. You see, they were speaking evil before the congregation. They were so brazen and bold, so deceived and deceptive, that they would go right into the very presence of where God was speaking and teaching, preaching, leading and feeding. And they would go in and they would try to distract and divide and pull away. I see it still today, friends, still today. So do you. I believe many of you recognize it today. And for those of you who don't, let the fruit tell you the story about the root. When you hear the back talk, when you hear that, well, I'm just saying, when you hear that, well, I don't know, I, you know, I, as far as I'm concerned, and you hear the rationalization of the poison, run away, run away. I promise you, when you dance with snakes, it's only a while before you get bit. If you swim with the sharks, they will eat you. It's just a matter of time. I see it over and over and over and over again. No, I'm fine. No, I can handle it. No, they're not that bad. The enemy counts on that. 
So they were speaking evil of the way before the congregation. But then he, Paul, what does he do? Paul responded by withdrawing them away. Paul took those who were being poisoned and he protected them. Now, it's interesting because I've heard it said, uh, they, they've pointed at this and said, oh, look, it's one of the early church splits. It's a, it's a split in the church because Paul withdrew from them and he took the disciples with them. But you know what? That's not the case. This is not a church split. This is church separation. This is not church being divided. This is church being defined. You see, just because they're in a synagogue, just like just because somebody's in a building with a steeple and it's called a church doesn't make them the church. This is not the church being divided. This is the church being defended. This is the church being defined. Paul is not splitting. He's separating. He's taking the silver and he's leaving the dross. He's taking the gold and he's leaving the dross. He's taking the wheat and he's leaving the weeds. He's pulling away the sheep and he's staying away from the goats and the wolves. That's what we see. Paul withdrew from them and he took away the disciples, the believers, the good soil with him. And what did he do? He continued to reason now afresh. And just like in Corinth, when he left the synagogue and he went across the street and he opened up shop in Justice's home. Here again, we see the same pattern in Ephesus. He's going to leave the synagogue after three months because the religious are pushing him out. They're rejecting God and the gospel. And so what he does is he goes down and he rents a hall, the hall or the lecture hall of Tyrannus. And this is beautiful because what you're going to see here is another portrait of the contrast. You see, some of the earliest manuscripts tell us that not only did Paul leave the synagogue and go and open up shop here in this lecture hall, but he did it between the hours of 11 and 4. You see, in the context of their culture, you would work from sunrise until approximately 11 o'clock in the morning. And from 11 o'clock to 4 p.m., you would have a hiatus or um, a, a break time that the culture didn't work in that time because it was the heat of the day. And then they would come back to work at four o'clock and work into the dusk. In fact, it's been said, some of the historians said that in their time in Ephesus, there were more people awake at 1 a.m. than at 1 p.m. because the culture would be such that they would go home from 11 to four and they would rest. They worked hard in the morning, they would rest from 11 to 4, and then they would go back to work in the late afternoon into the evening. So what's the point here? I want you to see, Paul didn't need a fancy synagogue. As we've seen before, God has used him and the church has gathered at a riverside, in a marketplace, in people's homes, here in a lecture hall, kind of like us in a converted warehouse in a movie theater, in an APY office. It doesn't matter the place. But notice the perseverance of Paul. He's out working. And when everybody else is going to go home and go to sleep, he uses that time. And this is incredible because the scriptures say that he did this for the next two years. And we know that when you're in the synagogue, he would only have access to Jews in very limited quantities of time. But now he's gone ahead and he's got himself a new location that will be open to the public, Jews and Gentiles. Everybody is invited. And he's gonna have the opportunity to invest in the few, whoever they may be, that respond. And note this as well. Those that are there being led and fed, those that are being discipled, as Paul does what he told Timothy to do in 2 Timothy 2.2. He's pouring in to those who will pour out into others who will pour out. He's making disciples who will make disciples who will make disciples. And again, I draw your attention now to the Spirit-led. The Spirit-led live on mission. And perhaps most powerfully of all, note this. When everybody else is going to bed, Paul is going to his Bible. When everybody else is going to disappear, 
Paul and these men are going to disciple. And this is what's really powerful. This five-hour window, we're told through the historical books that Paul did this pretty much every day. Now, I want you to think about this because I'm one who's told I preach long. Well, our average sermons are approximately an hour, and I don't apologize for that. I'm not going to give you fast food when the Lord's equipped us with a full Thanksgiving banquet every time we come together. But note this, the example, the time commitment and the passion commitment. Paul's there pretty much every single day, five hours at a time. And in the morning, whether he was out making tents or discipling, we're told in Acts 20 that he went house to house, that he was active and he was tireless, tireless in the pouring out. I mean, literally, he'd be out discipling or working a secular job in the daytime. Then when everybody else went home to rest in the heat of the day, no complaint about a lack of air conditioning, no complaint about union wages, no complaint about a need for additional downtime, no talk of balance in his life. He was all in all the time, and he would work for the gospel of Jesus Christ, also known as living on mission, sharing the gospel that others might live. And then in the evening when the hall would be taken back and others would go back to work, we're told that he would go from house to house and disciple then again in a personal way. Oh, what a beautiful portrait we have. In verse 10, now we see the contrast has been laid out before us and now we see the purpose. It's to come to the Spirit fed. Again, this says, this took place for two years. I just want to draw your attention to this. What is this? This is the transformative power of the gospel of Jesus Christ through the shared proclamation of the gospel through the people of God. God's Spirit at work in Ephesus. This, the transformative eternal work of the Spirit through the man and the men of God and the women of God, no doubt. This took place. Took place. Again, I draw your attention. God wants you to know that this really happened. This took place. It's real. This is reality. These are not stories. This is not something for you and me to just disregard. This is a model. This is the inspiration. This is the blueprint. This happened. And it can and it should, and I pray it will happen again as we live, as the Spirit led, to get the privilege of going to those who will ultimately be Spirit-fed so that they don't end up like those folks in verse 9 that are Spirit-dead. This happened for two years. Again, note the time that is needed. Note the commitment that is registered. Note the stamina, the spirit-fueled stamina of Paul and those that are on this mission. And it happened, it took place for two years, so that. Here's the crescendo, here's the purpose. All of this, in contrast, the spirit-led versus the spirit-fed, the spiritual fight of the faith that has taken place, this all happened so that all, whosoever, Everyone, all who lived in Asia, everyone within their sphere of influence heard so that all in Asia heard. They didn't have the gospel rub up against them. They heard the proclamation of the gospel. They saw it attested to with lives that lived out this spirit-led life. They saw it attested to with the power of God. This was all so that those who lived, all who lived in Asia, heard the word of the Lord. They heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. They heard the means of salvation through Christ alone, by faith alone, His grace alone, for His glory alone. This is what it was all about. It was all about the proclamation of the gospel. It was all about reaching the lost, finding the lost, and growing the found. It's all about the glory of God through the shared grace 
of those who have been gospel saved and gospel sent. The spirit led, fought off the spirit dead, that there would be some who would come and be spirit fed. And it says that all in that region, all in Asia. And you know what's beautiful about this? In this two year window in Ephesus, our study of the scriptures would show us that here we have the church of Colossae founded. We have another church, uh, Herodopolis, that was founded. And likely the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3 all founded here during this time. We also know that Paul wrote 1 Corinthians during the closing of these two years. God is again so amazingly at work. And how? How is it that all of this took place? You see, Paul was in Ephesus. God worked through Paul as Paul made disciples, who made disciples, who made disciples. No doubt, Paul went out of town every once in a while, but the primary means of the ministry, the primary means of the church multiplying, the primary way that God changed the world, the primary way that this Asian region was populated by Christ and Christianity and the church grew was through Paul making disciples of men who would then go and make disciples and women who would then go and make disciples, who in turn would then go and make disciples. It's exactly what Jesus did. It's exactly what Jesus commanded. It's exactly what Paul has done over and over and over again because it's exactly what Jesus commanded. It's what we are doing. And it's what we will continue to do because it's what Jesus did. It's what Jesus commanded. It's what Paul shows us. It's what Paul emulates. It's what the word of God calls us to. So I ask you again, friends, whose side are you on? Whose side are you on? Let me leave you with this because I was so taken back by the incredible contrasting portrait that we see here. If you look at verse 8 and you see the spirit led as they are contrasted with the spirit dead, we see this, that the spirit led people. And again, I ask you, whose side are you on? The spirit led people are the people who go. The spirit dead say no. The spirit led risk. The spirit dead resist. The spirit led do. The spirit dead don't. The spirit led challenge the religious, and the spirit dead coddle the religious. The spirit led are consistent. The spirit dead are inconsistent. The spirit led say no matter what. The spirit dead say maybe, sometimes. The spirit led speak out. The spirit dead lay low. The spirit-led are seeking refinement, while the spirit-dead are seeking retirement. The spirit-led bring truth and love. The spirit-dead bring lies from Satan. The spirit-led are bold, whereas the spirit-dead are cold. The spirit-led are opportunists, whereas the spirit-dead are pessimists. The spirit-dead bring eternal reasoning whereas the spirit dead bring endless complaining. The spirit led are engaging others, whereas the spirit dead are enraging others. The spirit led are persuading, whereas the spirit dead are dissuading. The spirit led add to, they add to that which they are a part of. The spirit dead subtract from, they're takers, they drain. The spirit-led, they seek all. The spirit-dead, they seek small. Just me, just me and mine. The spirit-led bring out the kingdom of God, whereas the spirit-dead want only the kingdom of good or self. The spirit-led see Lord and servant. The spirit-dead see self and Lord Finally, the spirit led have a want to, whereas the spirit dead won't do. And you know, as if those contrasts, and that's, that's directly from the word of God. Those are inferences from what is in verse 8. But now when you look at verse 9, 
you see the same kind of contrast, but now it's inverted. As in verse 8, you see in the beauty of the want-tos versus the won't-dos, in verse 9, you see the contrast, the sad, tragic contrast. Again, inverted. You see, if you walk through verse 9, you'll see that these spirit-dead people, they say things like, but, but, but. Whereas the spirit-led people say, and, yes, and more. The spirit dead, they're the some men. The spirit-led people, they're the true disciples. The spirit dead, they are constantly deteriorating. The spirit-led, they are constantly inspiring. The spirit dead are bruising. They're bruising the church. The spirit-led are building the church. Praise God. The spirit-dead are cold and hard. The spirit-led are warm and tender. There's a koinonia. There's a love for each other that no amount of knowledge can take the place of. You see, the spirit-dead, they're stubborn, whereas the spirit-led are newborn. The spirit-dead are disobedient, and the spirit-led are obedient. The spirit dead are fearful, whereas the spirit led are faithful. The spirit dead bring poison. The spirit dead bring poison. And the spirit led bring passion. Praise God. The spirit dead have toxic tongues. And the spirit led bring truth and love. The spirit dead, we see it here, they are evil attackers. They are evil attackers. That's the word of God. Whereas the spirit led, they are evil confronters, like shepherds against wolves. The spirit dead are evil attackers, and the spirit led are evil confronters. The spirit dead are, per 1 John, they are children of the devil. I know you don't like hearing that, but 1 John tells us God's word. The spirit dead are children of the devil. The spirit led are the children of God. Spirit dead are at times evil wolves. The spirit led are loving shepherds. The spirit dead are evil goats. The spirit led are loving sheep. The spirit dead say me, me, me in all different ways. The spirit led say be, 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 Lord use me. Last three, the spirit dead want more and more. The spirit led say amen and amen. The spirit dead are ambassadors of hell. And the spirit led are ambassadors of heaven. Unless somebody brings the gospel and the Holy Spirit changes their heart, the spirit dead are doomed Whereas, praise God, by his grace, the Spirit-led are delivered. Friends, this is the story of Acts 19, 8, 9, and 10. I ask you, whose side are you on? And before you answer too quickly, I plead with you to take true inventory of your life. Would your life say that you are like Paul? living all in. You are sold out. You go where the Lord tells you to go. You embrace who and what he tells you to embrace. You speak out. You reason with. You persuade boldly. Or are you stubborn, hardening, disobedient, Continuing in unbelief, speaking out evil, even if it's through silver tongues. Are you hurting the church? Or are you helping the church? Are you here to take? Or are you here to give? Do you say, I want, 
Or do you say, I'll worship? I ask you, friends, whose side are you on? When was the last time you personally engaged intentionally, went outside your comfort zone, reasoned with, persuaded, spoke out boldly on behalf of Jesus the Christ, sharing the gospel, the good news, starting with the need to repent and believe. You see, this is the life that is on mission. I'm so, so concerned about those that simply want to check off that they go to church, but are not willing to come to Christ. I'm so, so concerned for those who are stubborn instead of surrendered. I'm so, so concerned for those who are speaking evil and hurting the bride of Christ under the cloak and covering of religious deceit and personal deception. I'm so, so worried that there are those who do not know the difference and are being deceived. Friends, let us embrace the gospel. Go and tell. Invite people to come and see. Friends, don't let my question of when was the last time you did it stop with one time. Don't be satisfied with saying, well, I did that a week ago or I did that a month ago. You see, the call on our lives, the, the reason why Christ died of the church, our commission as Christians is to live this out every single day, to work feverishly, fervently to be ambassadors of this truth on fire. Let us get worn out with this walk of worship that others might come to know what we claim to have. Let us bring glory to God by being ambassadors of his gospel. And get ready because it's going to be a fight. There will be some men who will try to attack you directly and indirectly, who are trying to rape and hurt the bride of Christ, many of which will have a big smile on their face, many of which will be wrapped in religious cloaking. It's going to be a fight. We were told that was the case. Jesus said, if they hated me, what makes you think that they're not going to hate you too? Go put on my armor and be. Oh, that that would be us. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for the truth of your word. I thank you that your spirit has opened up our eyes, that you have given us the word that we need not walk through this life ill-prepared. Lord, you told us what to expect and how to get ready. Let us simply say yes, Lord, to all that you have. Let us truly be spirit-filled and spirit-led. Lord, help us to fight off the spirit dead, to get to those that you would have be spirit-fed. Oh, thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen and amen.